At the age of 30, I received a deep calling in my heart, telling me to make a pilgrimage on foot to Jerusalem. At that point in my life, I didn't have any other choice but to obey this calling, and I made the paradoxical realization when you don't have any other choice in your life but to surrender to the only open door, you may surprisingly experience the greatest possible freedom. At least that's how it was for me. And so I packed my backpack with a violin, a sleeping bag, and a Bible, and I set off on foot from Vienna, Austria, where I'm born, to Jerusalem. On my journey, I spent the nights sleeping in churches, monasteries, graveyards, football stadiums, abandoned houses, gas stations, bus stations, police stations. I once slept in a stable with a goat, once I slept in a chicken farm with a thousand chickens. Once I slept on a bee farm hiding from police among the bees. I once slept in an onion factory in a sausage tent. And I spent many nights sleeping under the stars in deserts. One thing I noticed on my journey is people's suspiciousness towards their neighbors. While walking in Austria, I heard voices warning me against the cheating Italians. While in the north of Italy, I was warned against organized crime in the south of the country. In Greece, I was warned against their hostile Turkish neighbors. While in the south of the Turkey, I was warned against the aggressive Syrians. In Damascus, I was warned against the Jordanian terrorists. And finally, the Arabs and Israelis are also not very happy with each other. I arrived in Jerusalem three days before Christmas, quite tired, but very happy. However, in Jerusalem, I was very much in doubt about the next steps in my life. Should I take a plane back home to Europe, or should I perhaps walk back the same way I had come? Yet one evening, I watched a travel documentary on TV about a journey to a little town called Aksum in the north of Ethiopia. There, many believe the Ark of the Covenant with Moses' Ten Commandments is being hidden. When I watched this report, I knew that it was a new calling for my life. And while feeling a little bit like Indiana Jones, I packed my backpack again and set my first footsteps in the direction of Africa. When I crossed the border into Egypt, I had very little money left. After walking for almost a year, I had spent nearly all my money. But I felt deep in my heart that I was being taken care of and provided for, and I kept on walking. My great master plan was to sell my violin, my only sword in life, to finance my walk to Ethiopia. When I arrived in Cairo, 
I started to ask people where I could sell my violin. And people told me there are music shops in a street called Muhammad Ali Street in the middle of downtown. I went there, but none of the shop owners were able to pay the price that I claimed. And while feeling a little disappointed, I went back to my hotel room. Then I heard about the Cairo Opera House, and I thought perhaps one of the musicians there would buy my violin. The Cairo Opera House is a big theater, and I got lost in one of its many corridors until I stumbled upon the musical director in his office. I told him that I was looking for somebody who'd be interested in buying my violin. And he told me his orchestra were looking for a violin player. And he asked, wouldn't I like to audition for his orchestra? Well, I did, and I won the position. And the week after, I took part in the orchestra's program playing Mozart's magic flute in the Arabic language. One day, I watched a news report on TV about the Egyptian authorities storming the Cairo garbage areas and confiscating and culling the garbage collectors' pigs, all their livestock. This was during the international outbreak of the swine flu pandemic. I'd already heard about the Zebelin. I was curious and I wanted to see for myself. And so I visited the garbage city, the world's largest garbage area, and my life changed forever. I'd never seen a place as dirty and as terrible. However, among pigs smoke and fire, children eating from the garbage, dogs copulating in the streets, and rats chasing cats, I found something that I had lost many years before. In people's faces, shy, gentle handshakes, curious and radiating smiles and laughter, I found real life. By then, I'd already earned enough money from my work at the opera, and I was ready to walk to Ethiopia. Yet something was aching inside me to spend more time with the Zebelin. For days, I was torn between staying faithful to my calling to walk and my new dream, which was to be with the garbage collectors. Finally, with a divided heart, I decided to continue my walk along the River Nile through Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia. When I arrived at Aksum in the north of Ethiopia five months later, I did not find the Ark of the Covenant with Moses' Ten Commandments. Instead, I found a new calling in my heart, telling me to go back to Egypt and live my life with the Cairo garbage collectors. Hell, wadi ame te agin fel badderia. 
Ude gick på jädden, koko koko, fel fageria. Jalla binala babala, ja sa nej, ja, 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 Hala el nahar fatah ya alim Wel gib ma feshi walla malim Min fel yo min dol shaft haltim Bzaye samaya el mazalim Da sabr amru tal Wa ish bad wa fel hal Yalli mak el mal Bardu el fayir li rabbi karim Bardu el fayir li rabbi karim Musa was the first friend that I made in the garbage area. He was a shy 23-year-old guy who came to me and asked if I could teach him English. He invited me to his home and showed me around in his area. We spent a lot of time together at cafes, smoking water pipe, watching American wrestling on TV and playing cards with the other garbage collectors. I taught him a long list of irregular English verbs and he taught me foul language in Upper Egyptian <laughs> dialect. I remember he had a problem learning the word downtown, which he instead pronounced town down. <laughs> Musa was working together with his one year older brother Saman, cutting beer and tuna fish cans on a shredder machine. They were always fighting each other, and they were not able to work together. Instead, they had to work separated, Musa in the morning and Saman in the afternoon. In fact, I never saw them together not fighting. Sometimes they were standing in the street, face to face, just screaming at each other, and somebody, usually their dad or a neighbor, had to pull them away from each other. People feared that one day they might kill each other with a metal stick. Saman had already married and his wife had just borne him a son, while Musa was still struggling hard to be able to afford the necessary gold and jewelry as a dower for his fiancée, which his dad had promised to help finance. Musa's family raised animals inside their home, pigs, goats and cows. The cows were living inside Musa's room, and the youngest one, a little calf, used to wake up Musa by pulling his mattress and licking his hands in the morning. Musa spent hours talking to his little calf, and the calf replied. When she grew older and bigger, 
Musa's mother one day told him to take her to the Friday market and sell her. The calf gave Musa a sad look and cried, telling him she did not want to be sold. She much rather preferred to stay with him. Then Musa went home alone and he cried also. Musa introduced me to Mr. Nauruz, one of the elders in the Zebelin community. He was wearing a turban, a jalabeya, and a thick upper Egyptian moustache, and he agreed to rent me an apartment in his family building. The apartment was very, very dirty, but I felt at home. Yet after living in my new home for about two weeks, Musa called me late one evening, telling me to gather all my belongings and move out of the apartment immediately. In Garbage City, there are many government informants, and one of them had gossiped to police about a certain foreigner who was living among the garbage collectors. Police had come to Mr. Nauru's and interrogated about me. Was I a spy? A terrorist? Or a Jew? They had asked. And they forced him to pay a big bribe. In the next moment, I was standing in the street with all my belongings, but Musa helped me find another apartment in the garbage area. Sometimes I brought Musa with me to our performances at the opera. With the help of family and friends, he got just the right clothes, a jacket, a tie, and a pair of nice shoes to be admitted. And he was quite the man when walking through the corridors of the Cairo Opera House the first time. My Egyptian colleagues were shocked when they learned that I had brought a garbage collector to our performance. I, however, took a certain pride in living my double life between the garbage collectors and the opera. The Cairo Opera House was built in the middle of the 80s during the booming Yappi time as a part of the Egyptian government's prestigious beautification plan. While Musa, on the other hand, since the age of seven, used to roam the streets of downtown, or town down, <laughs> looking for ways to collect for their animals at home. Late one evening, without a warning, my phone rang. It was Musa in the other end, and he was screaming. They shot my brother! They shot my brother! Earlier that day, the Zebelin had taken to their streets, demonstrating against Christian discrimination after a church had been burned down. It had been only a few weeks after the beginning of the Egyptian Revolution, and it all began when radicals had found out about a romantic relation between a young Christian man and a Muslim girl. When the Zebelin were demonstrating, a large crowd gathered around them. Rumors spread that the garbage collectors were marching towards nearby Said Aisha to set fire to a mosque there. And a crowd of 3,000 men began attacking them. Soon after, the Egyptian army arrived and no less than 10 military tanks rolled into the garbage collectors area. And when it became darker, they started shooting people. Children as young as 12 years old were targeted, and the shooting didn't stop until nine Zebelin were shot dead, and more than 200 were injured. One of the men who were shot by the army was Saman, Musa's brother, who had left his wife and son at home to take part in the fighting. He was hit by a bullet in his chest and died on the spot. The hospital was short of everything, doctors, medications, and spare blood. And the scenery resembled a war zone with hundreds of relatives in despair looking for their loved ones. Musa held the murdered body of his brother to his and screamed. In the funeral the next morning, men and women were separated. The men sat on chairs in a line in the street, 
Family, friends and neighbors stopped by. Not a word was spoken. And their silence was emphasized by the women who were sitting in the corner, sitting crying, sometimes screaming. With Saman's death, Musa's family became desperate as he was now the only son left to provide for the whole greater family of eleven. When I later asked Musa about the Egyptian revolution, he answered, if the difference between before and after the revolution is my brother dead or alive, I prefer no revolution. Thank <laughs> you. 